I didn't know that one out of every two fish was farmed instead of caught. Aquaculture has been is just repeating the patterns of the wild, which is feeding small fish to big fish. You know, they go out and catch 20 million tons a year of herring and anchovy and um, menhaden, these little bony oily fish. They grind them up and press them out into a, a fat ingredient called fish oil and a protein ingredient called fish meal. And those are commodities that are internationally traded. And those are the key ingredients to make aquaculture feeds. That's how you get these special proteins and oils that these marine creatures require to be healthy. Fish meal has, the price band of fish meal has more than doubled and it's gone up between five and six X since 1995. We like dirty CO2 because that's cheap or people might pay us to take it. And our bacteria, you could say eat or remediate a lot of the things that the EPA is actually concerned about. Wow. These bacteria that can take the CO2 and use the hydrogen and grow. The proteins in those bacteria are intentionally very similar to the proteins of the small fish that the big fish eat in the wild. Puts off about 1.2 million tons a year of CO2. We could make 600,000 tons a year of our Novo meal from that. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are still at Indie Bio Demo Day. We are talking to David Say now from Novo Nutrients. What's up, man? Hey. Thanks for coming on the show oh, and great talking to, see to you us. Again. Yes, absolutely. And also, congratulations on finishing up the pitch and getting the company rolling. So let's talk about this. So, and as we talk about um, making nutri food from CO2, yeah. As we talk about that, I want to also um, give us the quick bit on that, and then we'll get into the detail, but I also want to know about who you are and how you even got to this point. So right. you know, give us the quick bit and start with the, how you got to the point where you're at. Okay. So I uh, graduated college at the dawn of the commercial internet, and I developed a taste for entrepreneurship in that context. Right? And then in the early 2000s, I realized that I didn't want to keep making e-commerce sites for um, baseball cap collectors and that kind of thing. I wanted to do something that was more important for fundamental human needs. And so uh, not long after that, I discovered aquaculture, which is to say, I really had no idea where seafood was coming from before that. I, I didn't know that one out of every two fish was farmed instead of caught, uh, even at that time. That's the stat. And huh? one out of every now two. it's more, now it's a majority of seafood is farmed. And, um, but there was this incredible pioneering work being done by people in the open ocean like using the other 98% of the Earth's water surface that we don't do much with um, to grow food. And like Jacques Cousteau said, we must farm the oceans as we farm the land. And he was like way ahead of his time, but that's starting to happen now. And it's an, it's an incredible resource. Um, so I, got, I actually got fired up by reading an article in Wired Magazine. And then uh, I found that one of, my, one of my college classmates, a friend of a friend, had independently developed an identical interest. And he was a very successful serial entrepreneur, um, and so essentially he had the money, I had the time, and we started a, a group called Aquacopia together, originally as the aquaculture investing arm of his family office, and later as an independent uh, fund management company with a venture fund. And so how did you go from Aquatopia to Novo Nutrients? It's yeah. Aquacopia, like Cornucopia. Yeah, yeah. Aquacopia. Um, so basically, <clears throat> it was always clear to me that one of the biggest opportunities in aquaculture was what you feed the fish. Because everything else is very specific. A salmon farm is very different from a tilapia farm, which is quite different from an oyster farm or a seaweed farm. The one thing that like, not all, but many of those things have in common and almost all aquaculture has in common is you gotta feed the thing so you can eat it. Yeah. And everything in the ocean has evolved for hundreds of millions of years to eat other things in the ocean, Yeah. right? But on land, for the last 20,000 years, we've gotten good at, at producing a few things, oil seeds and grains mostly. And there's not much of an overlap between those, right? Fish and shrimp in the ocean, they wanna eat other fish and other shrimp. Mm -hmm. That's not what we can grow in our fields. And so there's this fundamental technology opportunity, actually a biotech opportunity Interesting. So you to have serve to that. grow ocean food to feed ocean food that we want yeah. to eat. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Or it so has to at least simulate it be nutritionally equivalent, equivalent to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, yeah, so take, keep, so, continue, continue. So really, 
you know, what aquaculture has been is just repeating the patterns of the wild, which is feeding small fish to big fish. And so, you know, they go out and catch 20 million tons a year of herring and anchovy and um, menhaden, these little bony oily fish. They grind them up and press them out into a, a fat ingredient called fish oil and a protein ingredient called fish meal. And those are commodities that are internationally traded. Um, and those are the key ingredients to make aquaculture feeds. That's how you get these special proteins and oils that these marine creatures require to be healthy. But those are commodities that have been under tremendous pressure and the prices keep going up and up. So like, even in the time that I've been in the business since 2004, uh, fish meal has, the price band of fish meal has more than doubled and it's gone up between five and six X since 1995. Um, Whoa, and, and that's the wrong way. We want it to drop. Yeah, I think so. If we want to um, preserve our oceans and not overfish them, and if we do, if we want good food to be relatively inexpensive, um, if you're going to eat an animal, you need to control the cost of what you're feeding that animal, um, and you want to do it with something that is also doesn't have contaminants because you know that mercury and things like that will end up uh, in people. And so there are a lot of reasons uh, to try to make use of inexpensive resources to generate feed. And I met uh, this company, Novo Nutrients, before it was Novo Nutrients, um, when they were more of a, a little more of a science project, and realized that they were taking untreated industrial emissions of CO2, basically pollution, and turning it into nutrition. And that blew my mind. Yeah, and yeah. What, how does that work? What is the CO2 that is being yeah. transitioned to nutrients? So it's a lot like the way that, that those plants in the field work, right? If you're, if you're uh, a stalk of wheat, uh, it's using photosynthesis to take CO2 from the air and solar energy, and then you know that's what grows the cells in the plant, forms the wheat that eventually you know is in bread. Um, and there's some water and soil, right? Yeah, nutrient as well. Exactly. Like and so we use, need exactly the same things. We we also use water. Mm. Uh, we also, but not nearly as much. A tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the water that you would use to grow a plant on land and uh, we need a little. We need a little bit of nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur, like the, the elements that you want. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that we need is CO2, mm -hmm. and then secondarily we need hydrogen. So in our case, it's the same kind of CO2 capture that plants do. We're just doing it in an industrial setting where the CO2 is being made anyway by a cement plant or by the you know milling paper, um, making steel. These are all things that produce a tremendous amount of CO2 that has nowhere to go besides the sky, and so we give it a second life in a very valuable way. So the CO2 that is a byproduct of steel and these massive industrial processes can then have a Novo Nutrients yeah. section of, of the Yeah, basically factory. you just got it, you get the CO2 to us and we feed it to our bacteria. Okay, and now let's, okay, cool. So let's talk about this. So the, the CO2 comes to you, what does Novo Nutrients have that you said feed it to the bacteria? Yeah. Okay, and then they keep telling us about that. Okay, so, yeah. so this is actually the core of our intellectual property and the, and the heart of our technology. Whatever you can tell us, yeah. Yeah, which is to say, it's a framework for designing consortia. Consortia. Consortia means different kinds of microbes that work together, mm. where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. And so in our consortia, um, the core primary producers are these bacteria that can take the CO2 and use the hydrogen and grow. But then there's another layer around them of, of secondary producers, other species, other strains, that can't survive directly on CO2 and hydrogen, but the waste products of the prime producers give them what they need to thrive. And so in this way, like mm -hmm. consortia nature, which are, you almost never find a microbe by itself, because in the same way that nature abhors a vacuum, evolution is going to use all the resources that are available in an area. And basically, you know, organisms are going to evolve and move in until almost all the resources are used. And it, at the microbial level, it's, it becomes, it's these consortia. Um, and so that's our, our patent application, or one of them at least, is around a very particular subset of all the possible consortia that is specifically designed to um, to be able to produce nutrition 
very efficiently, quickly, and inexpensively from industrial CO2. So what exactly happens? The bacteria is a bacteria that takes the CO2 and uses that to do what that enables it to grow and... Exactly, so these are microbes that grow by cell division. Yes. So it's exponential growth and we're just giving them the food that they need to split to make more bacteria. And then that those microbes are the food that the f aquaculture wants. Yeah, I mean, it's... Fish meal. Exactly, the, the proteins in those bacteria are intentionally very similar to the proteins of the small fish that the big fish eat in the wild. So the pro a, a profile of a protein is like what amino acids are in it, mm -hmm. which of the building blocks of protein are in it and to what degrees. And so our inventor and, and founder, Brian Sefton, designed this uh, consortia specifically to try to get an amino acid profile that's like an anchovy, which is sort of the gold standard for marine proteins. And so we've gotten it's very interesting to see the graphs next to each other. We've gotten quite, quite close. Um, but what's even more interesting is if you take away the fish meal amino acid graph and put in the nutritional needs of a specific animal like a salmon uh, or a shrimp, because that's really what you want to, you don't want to necessarily substitute for what they eat. You want to substitute for what they should be eating. What would be the perfect protein for them? And there's this concept of, um, of an ideal protein, which is actually that and we're doing some work to try to achieve ideal proteins. But that would be next generation for us. That's not what we have today. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, so then there's this, you kind of, you, you put it as a, uh, a golden standard yeah. of maritime it's marine called, protein. It's called, uh, the, the good stuff is called super prime fish meal. Super prime fish meal, interesting. Yeah. So then the same a composition of amino acids that make up the proteins in fish meal, you have bacteria that is yeah, absorbing from CO2. We're close. Cl oh, close we're yes. better in some, worse in others, but we're working on This is really a first draft for us, what we have today. And we have many ways to improve as we go to Mark II, Mark III, and so forth. And then, uh, David, how receptive are the fish in the aquaculture to <laughs> eating the fish meal? So we, uh, we just did a test, actually. Um, so the USDA and the US Fish and Wildlife Service have a joint lab in Bozeman, Montana, where this is pretty much all they do. Um, Sweet. Yeah, yeah, our tax dollars at work. But yeah. in this case, yeah. you know, to create better and cheaper seafood is, really, is, is mainly what they're thinking about. Yes, yes. And so uh, they set aside 200 trout. Half of them got the control diet, which had the super prime fish meal in it and half of them got a diet which was, gosh, I think it was about 40% Novo meal, which is much higher than you would actually use in a real situation. But they wanted to see, is it safe? That's the first thing. Yeah. And yeah, the uh, safety levels were like almost identical. But then it, it also, you could also measure growth. And what we saw was, especially as time went on and the fish were bigger and therefore, um, you know, it would be more expensive to feed them because they eat more when they're bigger. Our growth rates were better than the, than the control. And so that's like very promising for us. Yeah. 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 So yeah, growth rates is huge. And then also I'm curious if the, the cost to feed becomes much less as well. Yeah, so... Um, You're not going and taking a crap loads of fish from the ocean to feed other Fish. Exactly. So if you, if you look at the publicly traded companies that do that, right, they're companies that special, they have fishing fleets, they go catch the fish, they process it into these ingredients, they sell the ingredients. The publicly traded ones um, seem to have around a 7% average profitability, right? Um, our gross margins should be 60% yeah. at scale. Yeah. Now, that's not all going to that's not going to translate to cor all the corporate profitability, but there's a huge difference there. A huge difference. And yeah. so we and sustainability as oh, well. Not, you take CO2 instead of take wildlife. Yeah, yeah. And so that means that our production cost is just much lower. Yeah. I mean, that's and the simplest way to say it. Now, now, can you use just any CO2? Does it have to be like a somewhat clean source of CO2? You know? We like dirty CO2 because that's cheap or people might pay us to take it. And our bacteria actually eat a lot of the things, or 
you could say, eat or remediate a lot of the things that the EPA is actually concerned about are in we, emissions. Are we not then eating the CO2, the dirty CO2? Because then if the bacteria eats the CO2, fish eat the bacteria, then we eat the fish. So then so I mean, digestion is all about breaking things down. Yeah. And when the bacteria take in these compounds, they're chemoautotrophs, they get food from chemicals. So they're actually, there are chemical reactions going in the bacteria that are taking apart the molecules that would be problematic for people. So when they take apart the problematic molecule, then that, what, what, what occurs so that it's not there then at all? Well, it's, it's like uh, the same elements can either be something very benign, like a healthy protein, oh, sure, sure. or it could be a poison. Right, so a good example of this is actually our bacteria uh, can take apart cyanide. So Whoa. we would remediate cyanide if it was in a, in a, in a flu stack. The, the one thing that we can't, you can't take apart, right, are elements. So we have to avoid elemental contaminants like mercury, oh. um, like arsenic, oh. or radioisotopes. Which is also, is that also why you can't like take mercury out of this whole fishing seafood dilemma? is because there's it's, something that limits our ability to take that element out? Yeah, it, I mean, the mercury gets in through the water and up through the food chain from like the very smallest creatures. Plankton, phytoplankton. And so once you get a tuna, how are you gonna get the mercury out? Are you gonna like go cell by, like. Cell by cell, you sure, can't, sure. Even, even then, I, I don't think we have the nanotechnology for that. So the best yeah. thing is prevent the mercury from going in in the first place. And for us, that means if the smokestack has a lot of mercury coming out of it, we don't use that smokestack. And there are billions of tons a year of CO2 from different kinds of sources. And so it's easy to avoid, or relatively easy, to gravitate to the ones that are producing the right kind of dirty CO2 yeah. for us. Yeah, and, and it's so interesting about how the bacteria breaks the molecule to the point where we're not actually, there's a chemical process that goes on that makes it so that we don't eat that. And I'm speaking generically, but yes. And this uh, is what we try you know, and do on the show. Yeah. We try and get down to the I, the I can't guarantee that every possible, you know, problematic molecule could be broken down. But we've looked at we've looked at the main ones that are actually present in flu gases, and we're confident that we can find sources in cement plants, steel mills, uh, oil and gas facilities, pulp and paper mills. Um, and bioethanol manufacturing, among other, those are just the top five. Just as a strange question, I guess, as you scale over time, the amount of fossil fuels that we use decreases over time. So where do you get yep. your dirty CO2 from then? Well, so there are a lot of industrial processes that are not related to fossil fuels that just have to create CO2. So, oh, interesting. Um, like what's so that? cement, for example. Uh, the, just the, the chemical process for the formation of cement produces CO2. a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement, gotcha. approximately, gotcha. right? And so, you know, down the street here, if you go to Cupertino, uh, there's Lehigh Cement, which is part of the Heidelberg Group, which is one of the largest, uh, if not the largest cement group in the world. And that particular facility um, puts off about 1.2 million tons a year of CO2. And we could make 600,000 tons a year of our Novo meal from that. Whoa, And that's a lot. The state of California limits these guys to releasing the amount of CO2 that they did in the late 70s or early 80s. And so if their CO2 wasn't being emitted, that's right. they could make more cement, more cement, which is what they're in the business of doing. So there's a lot of value here, yeah, yeah. not just in this incredible protein, but in also just make, you know, reusing the CO2 and preventing it from going directly into the atmosphere. Now, are you positioned right next to the cement factory or are you positioned at a centralized location where the cement factories from around the world ship their CO2 to you? Well, so the, the, there are cement factories that are significantly bigger than the one in Cupertino. There are ones that are four million tons a year or more, right? And at four million tons, that creates two million tons a year of product, yeah. which would be valued at around $3 billion, uh, which means it's, it has the same value as the annual production of soybeans from Nebraska, which is like Whoa. 330 million bushels. Um, that's a lot of protein. And so it, it, 
it, we don't we won't need multiple sources coming to one point. We can we can take can work with one the production to the inputs, and the inputs are okay, CO two cool, cool. and hydrogen. So that's the other part is the hydrogen. The hydrogen. Okay, yeah. okay. And then now, just give us the kind of the 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 you know the fish meal that you make, the super fish fish meal that you make. That that then is fed to aquaculture systems around the world through what would be this like right yeah what is so the, so there are multi billion dollar companies all they do is they make feed and some of them make feed for pigs and chickens and fish some just make feed for shrimp some just yeah. make feed for salmon yeah. and so these feed milling companies will be our customers. Feed milling companies. Feed mills. Okay, feed companies. cool. Yeah. So then you sell it to them and they go and distribute it to salmon or shrimp or whatever. Exactly. Because, cool. well, they're in the business of buying a wide variety of ingredients, ah. mixing them in different recipes, uh. and creating these feeds, which are a lot like, they look a lot like and are a lot like a dry cat or dog food. And then that's their product that yeah. they sell to farms or they yeah. sell to distributors. Okay, yeah. great, great. Um, is there something else about Nova Nutrients that we should know on the way out? Yeah. Um, everything I've just described is natural and will be regulated as such. Mm -hmm. uh, but half of our team are synthetic biologists and they're thinking about what kind of engineering can we do to create even higher value, better performing products. And so a lot of the things that today are considered that get put into feed like vitamins, enzymes, carotenoids, which are uh, really good antioxidants, right? Um, Omega-3s are things that we can have our bacteria manufacture internally, and then they won't have to be added to feed because we'll be delivering these, this value-added protein meal that's enhanced with all these valuable biochemicals. And then our customers at Feed Mills won't have to buy those things separately. They'll get a nice bundle. Um, and and that opens up all kinds of possibilities. And the reason why we can do that is because we have a generalized biomanufacturing platform that we have chosen to use first in animal nutrition and aquaculture because it's, that's just such a great initial market. Um, but it represents a fraction of what we can do. Oh man, this, is, and are you, are you how, where do you sit on like the long-term push for with companies like Finless that are working mm, on mm, mm, mm. growing the actual fish in sure. the big bioreactors? We see them as potential customers for us because we create nutrients from non-nutrients. And companies like Finless and New Age Meats and Memphis Meats take nutrients and turn them into food. So in a sense, they're actually very much like a fish farm. So they would or take another farm. directly from you. We think we can produce products for them. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because they want proteins and fats that their tuna cells can take up and grow and, grow. and replicate. And you These tuna cells are not, interesting. are not capable of taking the small molecules and reproducing the way that our bacteria can. And yeah, so yeah. We, we really want these new food tech companies to succeed because that's a market where we can get in on the ground floor and provide a higher quality protein to them and, and other things that they need at a lower cost. And, and this is also true for, for the uh, plant-based meat companies, right? So uh, with your Ripple or Beyond Meat or Impossible, um, you're out there buying a lot of specialized proteins from, made from peas or lentils. Yeah. But really what you're interested in is a high quality protein that doesn't cost you more than it has to. And so uh, yeah, we, we really wanna be a foundation of the food system, whether people are doing cellular agriculture plant-based meats or doing it sort of the old-fashioned way by raising pigs or chickens or uh, Mediterranean sea bass. I would have never stumbled upon that, this notion that you can have bacteria consume, microbes consuming CO2 that then can um, feed. Evolution's amazing, fish. man. And, and yeah. we didn't have to build it, right? It was out there for us. We just had to put it in the right framework. Yeah, put it in the right framework. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's 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 the des it's the design of the uh, of the selection of the specific amino acids that make those proteins that then can be fed to the. Our core intellectual property is 
a framework for designing consortia of microbes. Yeah, consortia of microbes. Not just bacteria, yes. but okay. our patent application also specifies specific types of yeast, microalgae, yeah. uh, other fungi yeah. gotcha. that can all work together. And gotcha. we're just enabling the growth not only of our workhorse bacteria that can, work, that can live on the CO2 and hydrogen directly, but dozens of other species that have their own special properties that can now indirectly live on CO2 and hydrogen. That's the magic. The, the oh, consortia of microbes can use the CO2 as the fuel for them, and do they then make the specific proteins that you want to feed the fish? Yeah. Um, we don't have like precise protein by protein control, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but you can change the consortia. It's, li it's right. like an orchestra. So you can orchestrate. So yeah. you can, yeah. we want this many violins, we want this many trumpets, we want this many yeah. French horns, and that's the, that gets the sound right. You can't get it exactly, like, you're not gonna be able to get the sound waves exactly what you want, but you can get very close and sort of, you know, close enough for government work. This has been so interesting. Again, like you said, evolution's so fascinating. You just gotta put the right parts of the piece to get pieces together and then mm. boom you can do almost anything like this. this is nuts as humans we've now evolved to the point where we can use other e evolution and guide it and so uh, yeah. yeah directed evolution hopefully with lots of stewardship and, and love for planet earth and absolutely and care, like taking co2 mm. from the cement plants and putting it into fish feed. This is so, so interesting. Dave, thank, thank you so much no, for my talking pleasure, to really. us on no. our show. This has been super fun. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Much appreciated. Thank you.